uh, field of view is or 9.62 square degrees, which is very large compared to most, especially ground-based telescopes, but it's over a 40 field, full moon field of view as depicted by this image over here. Uh, that grid is the sensor array with respect to how large it will, uh, how much of the night sky it will see with a full moon. And then it's a, well, the compact of it, it's not very compact really, but compact meaning in this direction, it's squatty compact rather than being very long like a lot of other telescopes are. But we've got the 8.4 meter primary mirror, which is this largest circle down here. And then we've got the 3.5 meter convex secondary mirror, which is up at the top here. And then we got the five meter tertiary mirror, which is actually one monolithic piece with the primary mirror, but it has a different radius of curvature. So that's all one gigantic piece, and I have a fun picture of it at the very end of the presentation. Uh, the system length is a total of 6.4 meters from vertex of M2, so up top, to vertex of M3, down there. So that's what I meant by compact, um, compared to the actual width of the mirrors. And then the M1 co effective collecting area is 6.67 meters, because we do have this big thing in the middle blocking some light, which is the camera that we'll talk a little bit more about later or a lot more about later. Uh, but the camera is also pointed actually at the ground while it's observing the sky. So that was a little bit mind boggling for a lot of the people that we talked to because it seems counterintuitive, but the light bounces around a couple of times before it, it actually comes into the camera's uh, focal plane. Now here we've got the next level of the optical design, the fused silica lenses. There are also three lenses so down here, this giant one you're seeing is the first lens, or the L1, and it's a 1.55 meter diameter, which is the world's largest optical lens. It actually holds a Guinness World Record. And then some, if anyone's into photography, a lot of people ask what the F number is for the camera, and it, I've been told, is 1.2. Uh, and then the other important part of the optical system would be the lenses, or sorry, the filters. We have six filters, a U-Grizzly band pass set, that's depicted over here. Um, each one of them, you can, I mean, you can barely make out the numbers down there, but it, the total is 320 to 1050 nanometers of light. Um, we're gonna go on to the COM cam. So the, the telescope mount, which is called the Simoni Survey Telescope Mount, assembly is in place, but right now the mirrors are not yet installed. The commissioning camera, which is gonna from now on be called COM cam because of um, it's easier to say, but it has already been installed on and off of the mount in order to do some initial mechanical and refrigeration testing. And the COM cam is the, the same size as the LSST camera, but with only a tiny fraction of the sensors. So it's a lot less of that back end stuff, but it is perfect for using it to work with alignment and making sure all of the utilities route correctly into this telescope mount assembly. So then after the mirrors get installed, COM cam will be put back on to be on sky, even while the LSST cam is still getting up and running in Chile with its final testing suite. And then there is already data being taken at LSST speeds using Oxtel. Oh yeah, there, there's a picture of Oxtel. So that's Oxtel and that's the real observatory. Um, so the night ops team is already able to get into the habit of, or figure out all the kinks of taking data. And now we're on to the camera. Um, it's got, it's the world's largest digital camera, so that's exciting. It has another Guinness World Record for that. Um, and it's got a 3.6 degree field of view, six filters, like I mentioned, a total of 189 CCDs, which are charge coupled devices, a pretty common sensor used in telescope cameras. And the readout time is under two seconds. The whole idea of the legacy survey of space and time, oh, here I have it written, there it is. Um, it's a 10 year movie of the Southern Hemisphere night sky. So the Rubin Observatory will image the entire Southern Hemisphere every few nights, taking an image every 40 seconds for 10 years. We say 10 years, it's more of an at least 10 years, because everything is designed to last for at least 10 years. But as you may know from lots of other astronomy projects, things actually outlive their expect expected life time um, more often than not. So if it's still running and taking that useful data, then it can continue on past that initial 10-year survey period. So, But the result of that 10-year survey period will be an 825-frame movie 
in six filler, te six filter technicolor of every single object that it can see. Some key science drivers for the full project would be dark matter, dark energy. I'm not going to go into all the very detailed <laughs> here, but I'll just go into the main ones. Dark matter and dark energy, part of the reason why it's named after Vera Rubin. Um, cataloging the solar system, because it's going to see deeper images of the night sky than we've had from Earth-based telescopes before, and that wide field of view really helps with that as well. Milky Way structure and formation, and then it's also going to explore the transient sky. Uh, the hope is, or the idea is, that we're going to see many supernovae and anything that's changing, really. All right, now we're into the details of the LSST camera. So I've talked a little bit about it already, but now we're getting into the nitty gritty. Um, it's around 6,000 pounds, the size of a small car. I would maybe uh, say it's significantly larger than a small car. I drive a Mini Cooper, and I'd say just this front barrel part is bigger than my car, and then there's a whole bunch in the back that you can't see, uh, that you can kind of see there. So maybe more like a pickup truck, but I'll let you guys be the judge. It's got a total of 3.2 billion pixels. I mentioned that 40 full moon field of view. And then it's also an international collaboration, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. I'm gonna go through some of the exciting um, parts of the camera that I've gotten to be a part of since my time on the project. So one of the first big milestones that I was involved in was this full focal plane assembly. The focal plane is really what makes this camera able to be so large and take such high resolution photos. As you can tell by this image, um, it's mirror-like, it's very flat, it's very precise, and each of those little grid pieces is, you can't really see the gaps, you can see a little bit of the gaps, but um, they look like all very small gaps, that's because in between each of these uh, square sensor assemblies is like approximately half of one hair width of space. So that's why this picture of us staring at them as they get raised up into there, um, that was a painstaking process of getting these very delicate, um, expensive sensors all within that much of each other in order to make this uh, function the way that it needs to, um, to get those high resolution images. So yeah, that image is installing the last of the sensor assemblies. Each of those sensor assemblies we would refer to as a raft. And there are a total of 21 of them. And then there are also four, you might notice there's a little bit of a bigger gap on these corner ones. The, the corner rafts have different sensors that are intentionally raised and lowered so that it can help with positioning to get, give it kind of some perspective um, and make sure that we're lined up how we want to be. Here are some of the first images that were taken using the full focal plane. So I'll go back for a second. You can see that that's actually me. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm wearing the same glasses today. So that's my, me and my coworker, Travis. But I'm sitting in this like really dark space. And then where Travis is, we were able to put a door on there and make a dark box so that we could take these initial test images of just the full focal plane assembly before it was even on the rest of the camera. And on the left side, we've got a picture of a picture of Vera Rubin. The way that we took these, we actually had the image of Vera Rubin printed out in a box, and it's like the opposite of a pinhole camera. We call it the pinhole projector, because we need a source of light in this dark box that's only illuminating this picture. So it was inside of a box, there was a light and the picture, and the pinhole at the top that projected it out onto the LSST camera, and that's how these images were gotten. Um, and then on the right side, I don't know if anyone can recognize what that is, but that's actually Romanesco broccoli. Uh, <laughs> so I think some of the scientists just really liked that it has that kind of fractal design. Um, and so they put a piece of broccoli into the box to take a picture of that as well. Now we've got a fun little um, time lapse here. So once that full focal plane was assembled, it was the back end of it is here, and then the focal plane is on this end. And it was all lifted with perfect balance, somehow we really nailed the CG on that one, um, and then installed it into the actual camera body. So you'll see us moving around. This little camera we call the spy camera, because it's just a live feed of us in the clean room, working in the clean room, so that management can keep their eye on us. No, that's not the only reason, <laughs> but it, they can pan it around and take a, a look at what it is we're up to in there. And you can see that white end of the shiny silver part was actually a cover for the first or the third lens. So the L3 lens is on that silver 
portion on this side, we have the L3 lens. The focal point is inside. The silver portion is called the cryostat. It's a vacuum chamber that keeps all the sensors and their electronics very cold. Um, and that's all important also to these sensors being able to function as they need to. Now I've got another fun time lapse of the shutter installation. But while we do the prep work on the time lapse, we can look at this fun GIF of how the shutter operates. So you might be used to a shutter that kind of aperture goes like this. But if we did that, because we're taking approximately 15 second exposures, the center pixels would be overexposed. So instead we have this leading trailing blade design that allows for each pixel to see the light for the same amount of time, leading to an even exposure while we're actually taking images of the night sky. And so now we're installing this big funky fixture on the left hand side, and that is a five degree of freedom, motorized, computer driven um, tool that is used specifically for getting the shutter in and out of the camera because it's kind of like a big maze. It's like you're parking, parallel parking, but in like the smallest possible spot ever and in a lot more different um, degrees of motion. Now we were in there checking out um, some clearances. There's the shutter lifted intentionally at an angle, <laughs> I promise. Uh, it got bolted up onto that and you'll see it, it looks very fast here, but we did it very, very slowly the first time because it's really threading the needle right between um, our two larger lenses. There, it looked like we took a break for lunch, but here it goes. You can see it, it's all computer driven, and I'm the person sitting down at the computer there doing the driving while everybody else is watching the, the clearances. And there it goes. It's not all that exciting of a view, but it was a very interesting and involved process, and then now we're just gonna take off all the tooling. So the intent is not to have to change the shutter out very frequently, but we do have a spare, because it is the item that sees the most um, wear and tear. It gets cycled over and over and over every night. So if we do need to switch it out, we can pull out the one that needs servicing, work on maintenance for that one, and then put in the one that's already ready to go um, in the meantime. Now a little bit about the L1, L2 installation. So those are the two larger lenses, L1 being the largest. And they came to Slack in this large assembly that you can see kind of hanging by the crane over there. And they're on a carbon fiber hexapod that's able to mount it up with at an astonishing amount of strength because that thing is heavy. Um, so we were able to install the L1, L2 and then onto the rest of the camera body and then we actually performed a bunch of metrology. Slack has its own metrology division that comes and uses a little laser tractor to make sure that it's lined up in axis with the rest of the camera. It passed alignment check um, and then when you have the lens, lens caps removed like you do on that right hand side image, you can see this, the focal plane. And this one, this is the first picture I think I've shown today where you can see the two different colors of the sensors. And that's because when, when the project went out to look for vendors to make these specific CCDs, um, nobody was willing to make all of them because it was gonna be like so labor intensive and hard. So we have two different vendors of CCDs and there was no spec about what color they were. So that's why it gets this fun mosaic tile situation. But they all have the, they have all gone through rigorous testing to ensure that they meet our scientific needs. So don't worry too much about the colors. It looks kind of cool too. All right, and then we've got the filter exchange system testing. Another um, time lapse here. So in this one, we're actually just placing one of the filters into its storage box assembly. The storage box being this when it's full of all six filters. And you'll notice that that filter does not let any, or very little visible light through it. So it looked like we were just lowering down a disc of really shiny aluminum, um, which feels funny putting that in front of some sensors and saying you're gonna take pictures of stuff, but the sensors are more sensitive than our eyes. They're able to pick up light that's into the ultraviolet and infrared sides of the spectrum. So those filters will in fact be taking data even though it doesn't seem like they will. Um, some more from the filter exchange system. This video, I think, has sound. So this one is the, this is actually gonna be a dummy filter moving online, and that's, I think, 90% of full speed. So um, that's how it, the filters move in front of the focal plane. And then the place where they're stored, so you'll notice at the, at the beginning there, it was stored up there, and there are more stored where you can't see them around the whole thing. 
We did a bunch of testing first with the metal dummy filters. They have the same mechanical interfaces and same weight and center of gravity so that we could do all this testing before we ever handled the very expensive long lead time glass filters that are very delicate. And this is the part where uh, it was a big um, international collaboration because the entire filter exchange system was designed and initially tested by some colleagues in France. Um, so that was fun having them visit a couple of times and help with getting it up and running at Slack. This one's way slower because it was the first time we were ever moving it with the glass filter, but I'll let it run for a second. Uh, and this one's going to be the R-band filter, so it's, you can see it looks, the light that's going through it is orange, and now it's going into slow-mo for very dramatic effect. Um, but then the light that's bouncing back that you see looks blue. So that's kind of funky too. The, the filters are really quite beautiful to look at in person, um, and they'll be integral to us getting proper data as well. There you have it. All right, and then so now where we're sitting right now is we're doing full camera testing. You may have noticed from some of the earlier um, time lapses that this, this giant white fixture is able to rotate the whole thing into either horizontal or in this case vertical orientation. And so that anything in that picture that's white is just our camera integration stand. And then the camera itself, as you could tell from the earlier photos, was this this tube and then the narrower tube. And then these are the utilities that uh, go get us uh, water power. There's fibers in there and then also some refrigerant for the refrigeration system. But in full camera testing, what we do is we point the whole camera down and then underneath the camera stand down here, we put up panels to make it into a dark, another dark box. So this is what the inside of it looks like once it's fully set up. Um, and then in that dark box, we have this calibrated set of light sources. We're, we've got one that's called the flat illuminator. That's that red orb that just stays right in the middle. And then we've got the narrow beam. It's called the CCOB narrow beam. So that stands for camera calibration optical bench narrow beam. And it has it's not exactly a laser, but it's similar because it's a narrow beam of light and it is able to spin and then also it can tilt on this axis and then it's got full XY axis motion. So we can do some really extensive testing of the alignment of the lenses and the, the various sensors with that instrument. And then right above me, we took one of the dummy filters and we got it coated in what's called optical black. So it's essentially non-reflective. And then you can barely make them out in this picture, but we poked a bunch of holes in it. I poked, we machined them. Um, and that was in order to put pinholes from Thor Labs into there so that we can also have a pinhole of light at each of the, the center of each of the sensors for additional testing. So right now we've got three optical filters, one dummy filter and one and the pinhole filter currently in the camera. And it's running testing almost 24 seven uh, right now. Just a quick little fun picture of the different uh, media attention we've gotten. So I mentioned the Guinness Book of World Records, and that's our little segment there. I think we have a total of three Guinness World Records now, um, but it's very, yeah, very exciting. And then also the Mercury News for us locals came by and took pictures and put a whole front page article about uh, the camera. So that was very exciting when they were around. There's a filter selfie because I didn't have a good picture of full camera testing, but that's uh, myself in the reflection of some filters. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do, we're going to do more full camera testing. Uh, and then we're also going to swap out the other. So right now we've got three optical filters and we'll swap out for the other three optical filters and leave in the pinhole and probably one of the heavier dummy filters continue testing in January and then shipping, which is a huge undertaking. Everything must go like literally everything. Pretty much going to clear out the whole clean room and a bunch of other storage that we have. It's already being sent down. There's a this is a picture of at the summit receiving some of the earlier testing equipment that we're never going to need at Slack again. But if something goes wrong down the road, might need it at Ch in Chile. And then some everybody always asks how is the camera going to get down to Chile? Um, so what I always say is don't worry. We've thought about it a lot. Um, so it's got a custom shipping container which you can see in the picture right above me. Um, and it's got vibration isolators that are specifically meant for this camera. 
and we are going to charter a cargo plane to make sure that it's being watched like a hawk at all times. And then, like I mentioned, all the support equipment is going down. And the other thing that not a lot of people think about are, is all the documentation. And it all has to get translated into Spanish, too. So there's a whole team of people working on making sure that once it is down in Chile, the Chilean technicians are able to actually get this all up and running with, of course, support from Slack engineers and technicians. But uh, it's important that there's no language barrier uh, that causes issues there. And then we've got another picture of the dome. And oh, sorry. So this picture you're seeing here is actually when we shipped the mass simulator. So we have an entire camera mass simulator Similar to the dummy filters, it mimics the size, shape, and center of gravity and weight of the actual camera. We put it onto the camera vibration isolators, and we shipped it down to Chile, and we didn't even charter a plane for this one, so it was just on a cargo boat, and it was getting jostled around, and the vibration dampeners worked great. It had a bunch of data loggers on it, and it didn't see a single load that was um, beyond our expected or allowed loads. So that was it showing up in Chile on the truck. Um, but it'll be watched much, much more carefully when we have the real deal going on. And then while we're on this same screen here, this is a nice picture of the dome while it's open. Uh, so just for a little bit of perspective, I guess you can barely make out, there's a big yellow X in the back there, and that's the mass simulator for the largest of the uh, mirrors. And then there's like a tiny little tube in the middle that's also painted yellow, but you can't really make it out in this picture, and that's the camera which is like as tall as I am and the size of a car. So just gives you a little bit of perspective. I guess there's also some people. That's a person. So a little bit of an idea of just how big the dome is. It's quite a feat. I haven't been in person yet, but I will be going once the camera is ready to ship. So a little bit about operations and data management. I have a lot less detail on this specific topic, but I did steal some slides from one of our scientists so I could talk on it in case it was anyone's specific point of interest. But one of the major things once we do get the camera up and running in Chile is this transition into operations mode. We're currently in like testing and commissioning, uh, but we need to get into operations. And they're already working hard on building the Ruben user experience. So the final sky map will be essentially like having three million images kind of like this, tiled panoramic over the whole southern hemisphere sky. And then this shows a chart of the data holdings uh, that are expected to grow to approximately 300 petabytes over the 10-year period. I've heard the number thrown around that it's an estimated 30 terabytes of data per night. So that is also pretty insane to think about. Um, the Rubin Science Platform for any hobbyist astronomers, such as yourselves, um, this platform will provide access to the data set via a portal, um, and all of these different parts of the portal have tools so that you can query the information and you can visualize, analyze, etc. And then there's also tutorials so that anyone can figure out how to use it on their own. You don't have to be um, part of any fancy institution. This is a project that's specifically trying to help get data and science out to the public. Uh, the this project will measure trillions of measurements of billions of objects. So the US data facility is being built at Slack. That's another exciting, fairly recent um, decision that had come to be, is this new awesome data facility is going to be on site at Slack. Uh, the Rubin, there are also two Rubin data facilities globally. So IN2P3 is in France, and then IRIS UK. I don't remember where in the UK it is, but clearly in the UK. Um, but yeah, these will automatically process the images in order to measure brightness, position, any other data about the different objects, and it can be set to send alerts about if you're interested specifically in supernovae or whatnot, um, it will send out that kind of information to anyone that can then train their telescope, hobbyists, or for something like the James Webb telescope that has, can take even deeper pictures of the sky but can only have a much, much smaller field of view. We can have, we have collaborations planned with those kinds of projects to do this science together. So thousands of astronomers all over the world will be able to analyze this information and look at predictions from physical models to kind of keep looking for that dark matter side of things. A quick 
slide about the US data facility is that there's going to be some on-prem or on-premises data storage and then some cloud storage. Um, this whole flow chart shows the details of it, but the idea is that this hybrid model um, houses some data at Slack, but then the user's information and anything that goes public to the users can be on the cloud. I, I've heard that there's going to be a partnership with Google because they're really good about data um, and storing things on the cloud. And then it allows separation for any security concerns, uh, burst response, and re reduced risk for the project. So like I mentioned, cloud side will have the science users and any access provided by the platform, personal storage plus cloud access to co-ads, and also services run on the cloud in order to take advantage of elasticity. Then everything else pretty much is on-premises at Slack. All right, I think this is maybe my last slide, indeed. All right, so the Rubin operation status update. So schedule-wise, we're currently in camera testing, as I've mentioned. The expected shipment to Chile is in spring of 2024, and then a bunch of recommissioning on site before science operations start in early 2025. But as I did mention earlier, the commissioning camera, the comm cam, will be on sky significantly earlier than that I'm not sure of the exact date of that, but while we're doing all that re recommissioning of the real camera, the commissioning camera will start taking data to get things all ready for the real LSSD cam. And on the right-hand side, I just have a pretty picture of the observatory at sunset. And on the left-hand side, you can see what determined the size of our primary mirror, because this is the road up to the summit, and you can see how dang close we got to the walls in that box is the primary and tertiary mirror assembly. Um, so yeah, it couldn't have been much bigger than it was unless we were gonna somehow airlift it into place. So that's a pretty fun picture we like to show. And that is about it. Obviously, we have a bunch of social media presence. You can follow the progress on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, there's a website. Actually, on the Rubin Observatory website, there's a new game you can play. It's called like Space Surveyors, and it's trying to teach people about how you might want to go about trying to map uh, objects in the sky that are moving, like how to make a run plan for how to take images. So check that out if you're interested. It's a pretty, pretty simple and fun one online. But other than that, happy to take questions. Yes? Um, who are the vendors of the charge couple devices, and how big are the pixels that are Okay, um, the vendors, they're either, okay, so I don't even know what the name of the vendors, we call the two different types of sensors ITL and E2V, which I'm not sure if that's the actual name of the vendors or not. I don't know, a ton of, so unfortunately all of the development of the charge couple devices was when I was like in middle school, so I don't really know, know a ton about the details on that, um, but I know that those are what we call them. And then you asked about pixel size. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that one either. First vendor, ITL, IDMDs, and John Ellis and Murray. ITL, yes. Second one is E, and then the number two, and then V. I think it's pretty much like the Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes. I have two questions. Yep. Uh, one is, how do you deal with dust? <laughs> That's a good I mean, is there a dust problem? Is yeah, it, so. Mean, is it open to the atmosphere and? and when it's windy, will it blow? That's a good. That's, that's a great wind. question. So, well, dealing with dust before we ship, obviously we're in a clean room, very controlled environment. Um, one thing that I can mention is part of the reason why that specific mountain range, Cerro, Cerro Pachon Ridge in Chile is chosen is because it has very clean, dry air specifically. So there's actually a handful of different observatories all in that very um, quite close spot, so I guess I didn't include it in this picture, but if, from certain angles you can see a handful of other observatories, including one of the Gemini uh, telescopes down there. But if there's ever any like inclement weather, because it does snow up there, then the plan would just be close the dome for that day. <laughs> but we also do have ways of cleaning. There's a method for using, um, they call it carbon snow for cleaning the lenses if need be. But other than that, the dust becomes a lot less of an issue other than for the lenses and mirrors because everything else is pretty much closed up by the time it ships out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, question I go for it. Is, uh, 
since the thing is moving every 45 seconds, uh -huh. do you have uh, inertial problems of stresses and things uh, that cause vibrations and things? Or, or is yeah, that designed so, in such a fashion for all of those things sort of? Yeah, definitely. So that's part of, part of the reason why it, instead of having that usual, or not usual necessarily, but so often you have like the long cylindrical kind of rough design of a telescope, part of the reason why they made it squatty, compact, is so that that settling time can be as minimal as possible, even for this huge thing that's rotating on multiple axes. It also, while it's doing the survey, it's not like it's usually going to sling all the way to the opposite side of the sky. It's a fairly small chunks that it moves in. Um, as a general rule, but yeah, so that, that squatty, compact, um, short, I guess it's like six and a half meter length of the whole system really helps with the settling time and not making blurry pictures because everything's still shaking. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the same thing. The problems using the submit for photographing a structure in air glow structure and air glow. I am personally not very familiar with air glow, um, so I'm not well, sure. You mentioned that uh, it's going to be looking at things in the Milky Way, uh -huh. and uh, air glow, of course, is right at home. Yeah, oh, gotcha. So, like, well, there's been a huge everybody's a little bit pissed at Elon Musk about all those Starlink satellites. Um, so like, as, as far as like light pollution and whatnot, one thing about, because we're taking 15 second exposures, we're usually able to use the computer side of things to negate that, uh, any extraneous light pollution that is clearly not from, you know, beings or astronomical objects way out there. Um, so there's been a whole investigation of the Starlink streaking across the sky that we've done in one of our test, stand, test stands with a model of that, that kind of had a little light source that had a bunch of pinprick dots that went across. And so they're already working on how we can possibly minimize the effect of that uh, light pollution. Sorry, I hope I did a good enough job. Yeah. What, what do you yeah, got? the uh, L1 lens is huge. Do you have to yeah. worry about sagging? Oh, so that's, that's also something that's been looked at. So the carbon fiber struts, that's the reason why it's carbon fiber, is they're very, very stiff. Um, we've already been able, we did metrology pointing in both directions, so horizontally and pointing down, and there is very minimal sag so far. Um, obviously, as time goes by, it could get worse, but the other thing is it's almost never actually pointed at the more stressed, more saggy orientation. Like I mentioned way at the beginning, it's pointed mostly down at the ground or like with a slight angle in order to get, you know, the other degrees of the sky. But it's very rarely pointed at the, the most saggy aspect ratio. Any others? Yeah. Wait, so is like all the data put out like immediately after it's taken? Or like is there like a to, so it, within like less than, I think two seconds, sorry, the, it takes two seconds to get to the, down at the, the bottom of the hill and then under two minutes to get it to the data facility, uh, the U.S. data facility, but as far as like when it gets released to the public, yeah. there's a, I know that there's a longer waiting period on that, but I know that for certain things, like if it's something that's, oh, there's a supernova happening right now, they're, they're working on various different like machine learning ways of determining that this item needs to get sent out fast so that other people can take a look at it. I don't know a ton about how they determine which items get that kind of special fast track treatment. Um, but I, I know that the whole goal is for it to be public data, so they're they're definitely working on making sure that the important stuff gets out as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. What about um, earthquakes and the geology of that in that area? Oh yeah, so there are definitely even more earthquakes there than there are here, um, pretty frequently. So everything everything on the telescope and observatory has been designed with specific seismic factors that take into account that we are in Chile, where there's a specific region of Chile that there are a lot of earthquakes. So, sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's all been engineering. We took it into account during engineering calculations with all the factors of safety for seismic loading. 
obviously if there was an extremely catastrophic earthquake that was outside of those calculations, it still could cause damage, but we've done our due diligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah? What is a figure for the primary, secondary, and tertiary mirrors of parabolic versus hyperbolic? Um, I can go back. Wait. So both, sorry, my computer is not either. Sorry. Um, so parabolic versus hyperbolic, you asked. I'm not really familiar. I mean, all I can talk about is concavity and convexity. <laughs> sorry. Um, but the, yeah, so the, the, I'm not sure about the details of like the actual um, curvature if that's what you're asking. It might be listed online somewhere on the Vera Rubin Observatory website, but I don't know the details about the exact curve. I'm sorry. So the whole telescope uh, has the same optics as the whole length one, but all the collapsing the same functionality. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so is this just going to like put all like hobby astronomers out of business and well, it's only in the southern hemisphere. I couldn't, I couldn't oh, tell you for sure, but I mean, it can only ever see the southern hemisphere sky. So you're not out of a job if you're living in northern California. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I, it's hard to say, really. I'm not sure. It's not like the emphasis is on only finding those things, but if we do find them, alerts will go out. So. Cool. Yeah. Could, could you find Sarkovus and? How was this all conceptualized? How did what took into account all the what ifs that I've heard in this discussion? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so as far as when it was conceptualized, I think like late 90s was when it was initially proposed. Um, so it's about as old as I am. Um, and then it actually started uh, work at Slack at, in 2004, but work on the actual camera itself wasn't until 2014. Um, as far as all the what ifs, oh, I couldn't even tell you. There's so many. There's like very, very thick documentation that has all of these, you know, the questions that you all are asking today. Uh, a lot of scientists and engineers thought of many of these questions back when they were initially having the brainchild of the project and have tried in every possible way to mitigate them. But there's always something new coming up. So we've been doing a little bit of troubleshooting as we build as well, and I'm sure it'll continue once we're down in Chile, actually observing. Is the design through Slack or is it a multinational effort? Um, I know that it's multinational. The filter, at least the filter exchange system of the camera was designed by the French team that I mentioned. And then the mirrors were, I believe, both designed and built in Spain. So it's, it's really got a lot of different countries involved and a ton of different schools. Um, and then uh, just in the US, there is a bunch of work being done in Tucson, Arizona, like the lenses were fabricated by Ball Aerospace in, uh, in Tucson. And then a bunch of the folks that work with Noir Lab, which is like an associated uh, group, are out of Tucson as well. So it's kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. How does, like, do you guys own the land in Chile? Are you like friends with the like, university? Closer to option two. The, the group that owns the land in Chile is called Aura, A U R A. And it's some sort of acronym for um, universities doing astronomy work. But they own this whole plot, and that's why we didn't face uh, all the issues that you could face with trying to build on land that is has like you know cultural significance for other groups, as some of the ones in Hawaii and stuff have had. But yeah, so Aura is affiliated with the whole project and kind of has their fingers in a little bit of everything. So do you pay them, or do you just like? I'm not actually sure if. They get paid like on a like a rental basis or like anything like that. I I know that they oftentimes pair with the NSF, which NS or the whole LSST camera is NSF and DOE joint funded. So all those science institutions, um, not exact exactly sure how they commingle, but eh, I know that they let us build it there. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Could you tell me? How difficult the, uh, I, I guess I'd say the design of, of the thermal expansion and contraction of this whole system, uh, 
instance of the optical tolerances that need to be maintained here. Is, is this a particularly difficult telescope, or is it actually a fairly easy telescope to do along those lines because it's so compact? I am not 100% sure, but I would lean towards it would be easier because of the compact um, design. Uh, I know that the, the dome, because it's on a mountaintop in Chile, does have pretty wild fluctuations in temperature, but that's usually specifically day to night. So the nighttime temperature range is a lot smaller of a window. Um, and I'm not, I couldn't really tell you much about how they've, or how the thermal expansion has been taken into account, but I can almost guarantee you that somebody has done that work. But, but the telescope itself. Like all the mirrors? Well, I mean, the, the yeah, the whole thing. thing. Yeah, it, 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 not talking about the superstructure outside. Uh -huh. but, but the temperature fluctuations, presumably, of the optical system itself mm -hmm. probably fairly minimal. Yeah, the so they, because they're or, encompassed inside of the dome, the dome itself does, I don't think, has any um, like climate control, but there are uh -huh. purge systems that blow air through the whole camera and lenses area, so that keeps cooling on our, all of our, ooh, sorry, mm -hmm. the all of our uh, equipment is regulated and we've got a million different temperature sensors on the camera itself. So, um, also I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe that carbon fiber doesn't have the same kind of thermal expansion and contraction as, um, you know, metals or other different materials. So I think that that hexapod was specifically selected for not only its rigidity, but um, not, not having that sort of issue be introduced. The and, and the sensor, is, is, is that a flat focal plane, or is it actually a curved focal plane? The focal plane itself is flat, but then the L3, which is the smallest lens that's right on top of the focal plane, has a concave, or concave and then convex two faces. So it's designed to be a flat field. Yeah, yeah. Thing. So the, the focal plane itself is very, very flat. Mm -hmm. Simple question. You mentioned the dome is weatherproof. How do you get this thing in the dome? Um, so let's go back all the way to the video. Uh, it'll go in. If I go to the facilities picture, okay. it can get essentially. Whoa, I went too far. Oh no. Okay, laser pointer. So. Over here we have, I guess it's really hard to read for you all, but there is a camera clean room. This is the label that says camera clean room. So this, it can get driven in a truck right up next to this area here. And then there's a, an assortment of different um, lifts. So this is a platform lift that gets it up higher into the next area. And then up here, there's various different cranes for the smaller items, but then there's also a gigantic camera lift fixture that's like a hard, C-shaped metal um, thing that's already been used to install the commissioning camera um, from that like upper deck into the actual mounting location. So it's a it's a series of different steps, but it is possible because we've done it with Calvin Cam. Yes. In a couple of years, once this is running, how many people are needed at this location? Ooh, that's a really good question. I'm not actually sure how many people they'll have like during the night observing hours. I know that it's at least like a small team of scientists, but when you're not doing all of the like maintenance and commissioning side of things, it's mostly just going to be scientists, not not nearly as many of the technicians and engineers. Um, I could I don't have a number for you though. I could try to try to ask my my scientist. Ten, ten people. Yeah, I'd say probably rough order. You're on the right order of magnitude at least. Yes? Can you go back to the slide and show the principal science focus? Goals? Yes. I think that's here. So you're very early in your career and you get to work on this incredible, exciting project. Uh -huh. How much longer will you be associated with this? You, you work for Slack, I think? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I'm I'm an engineer, full-time staff engineer at Slack, and I actually already work on another project, too. Okay. Because, so as, as we continue going on and on with the LSST camera, 
it's kind of funny because we talk about how for us engineers it feels like it's kind of wrapping up. Meanwhile, the scientists are like, what are you talking about? It's just beginning. Like We're just getting our hands on this data. Um, so yeah, as we slowly simmer down on this, I'm working also on a project for a detector that's going to be actually underground in Canada. So I went from south and on a mountain to north and underground. Um, but as far as, far as uh, timeline goes, I'll probably still be working on the LSST camera for at least another year or year and a half before I roll off and fully go on to just the Nexo project. Yeah. So this thing will be going for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. in, in the five year frame, what sorts of improvements do you see that they will be incorporating into this thing to improve its capability? Oh, that's a good question. I think the main one I could pinpoint would be, obviously there's been a huge um, push and like just the general wave of all this AI stuff lately. Um, and I know that in astronomy, we've already been talking, usually the astro my astronomer coworkers or phys physics coworkers call it uh, machine learning, but it's the same thing essentially. Uh, it's already been part of astronomy, but the fact that it's improving at this rapid rate is really going to be helpful for our, our, our huge amount of data and how to really fish out what the important information is. I can't imagine that there would be really anything on the actual mechanical side of things that could be improved upon, other than maybe if they came up with a better way or a more efficient way to like clean the mirrors or the lenses. But I think AI seriously has some cool implications for like sifting through all that data. Yeah. So you're going to get to go to Chile when they when they install it, and what what will you be doing? Uh, I'm going to go to Chile when they first ship it down. Well, I'm not 100% sure how many different times I'm going to go to Chile. I'm never going to fully relocate, but we're, we're all anticipating taking a handful of different trips in kind of phases so that there's always someone who knows how the different tooling works down there. Uh, the main thing that's going to be like one of the first things that needs to happen other than making sure that all of it electrically is still um, functioning and nothing broke is putting the filters back in. So the L1, L2, all the lenses will stay on for shipping but the filters will come out and go back into their filter box and get shipped separately. So that's a huge one that has a pretty intricate um, electrical system that does that little mm -hmm. load it. And then once you have it inside of the filter loader, that gets crane lifted onto the top of the camera. Then it has to do a handoff into the camera system. So things like that. And then the shutter work I worked pretty heavily on. Um, that ex We call it the extraction rail because it's the thing that's pointing it into the perfect position and getting the shutter into place. So yeah, anything along that side of things. And then when it actually comes time to put it up onto the telescope mount assembly, I feel that the people that are already down there in Chile, because we do already have some Slack engineers working and living in Chile mm -hmm. and working with the ComCam, they'll have a better idea at that point how to do that step of the handling. So that's kind of going to be where the big handoff is um, from folks that are staying in California versus folks that have relocated to Chile. Yeah. You um, enable the equal exposure time for all parts of the focal plane where by virtue of the geometric or three-dimensional shape of the shutter and the other things you Yeah, so let's go back to the shutter. Oops, wrong way. Um, yeah, so the shutter, it has two sets of blades. And they're really quite thin. They're really blades. Like, if you had your hand anywhere near that, I'd be scared. Um, but the car it's carbon fiber and it's pretty flat, or very flat, and they come slide across, so that's opening it up, and then the trailing blade will come close it back you know, at the same speed with the same motion profile to make sure that we're getting the exposure we're intending. So one end is curved, the other end is straight. One, uh, okay. Like you mean over here? Or you mean on the shot? Oh, they overlap a little bit, is that what to make the fully fully blocking yeah. the light. It's a little hard to visualize how the shapes are computed for that. Because like why this part is bulged out over here. Yeah, I think it's just so that we took up less space in the camera. Okay. Yeah, I think it. I think if we had, we could have. There's no real reason other than that it's trying to save some space for like everything else that has to fit in there. Yeah, because it doesn't need to be larger than that in order to cover the circular aperture. I understand, that's very clear. That's a mechanical. Thing. Yeah, yeah. But what about the mechanism that people have in the exposure to all the 
I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think so. And I think they, they've already done a ton of sh uh, shutter testing. There was a whole subsystem before the full camera was assembled um, that just did shutter subsystem testing to analyze the motion profile and what was going to be ideal. Um, and that's how they settled on this roughly 15 seconds. Uh, but that's also very much, that's one thing that maybe if we notice that we're overexposing or underexposing things in real life, perhaps due to any of this stray light that we anticipate potentially seeing, then it could all obviously be uh, updated as we run. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go. So this is going to be transported on by ground or by by jet. By it's going light. in a plane. Well, we're going, air? We're chartering a cargo plane, yes. Okay. Yeah, and I know for a fact that some of my coworkers will probably not let it out of their sight and will be sitting in the cargo bay of the plane for that long flight from SFO to Santiago. And then from, so you can only fly into Santiago and then from there it'll be on a, an air ride truck up the mountain. Yeah. When you were controlling the arm that placed Yeah. Did you, did you pre-design the yeah, so actually I should have mentioned that there we even though all of this is all very one off, like you, yeah. you can only do it once with the real thing. Um, we had a, a test like a dummy shutter as well. So we were able to do that before there were any lenses on the camera. So we did it we did a, a couple different stages of testing with the extraction rail. So we did the all those motions. We even had a mock up for where we thought the carbon fiber struts of the L1, L2 assembly would be, made out of like PVC and three three D printed stuff. Um, so that we could practice, had it all written down, and then it's still surprisingly manual how you actually control the the extraction rail because it was like enter in a number of millimeters, hit yes, and then it's like, are you sure? And then, then like, yes. But there, I also had an e-stop on me all the time, so if there was going to be any issues, I could kill it. Yeah. Yep. Like, do the sensors ever just like fail or random pixels go out if you have a placement sensor? So, like, so there are. I know that they have some issues. It's usually just with noise, and then eventually this, they figure out what's going on. We haven't had any like full failures yet um, of sensors. There are some spare sensors, but the amount of work that it would take to uh, take it all apart in order to get back to that stage would be so insane that I think if one full sensor went out, they'd probably just keep surveying and until I it would have to take a, a significant chunk of things going out for it to be worth it to go back to that stage. But we are sending all the equipment that they would need to go back to that stage up to Chile in case they ever decide that that's necessary in the future. Yeah. My home camera, my SLR, uh -huh. has both a mechanical and a, an electronic shutter. Mm. Can you do an electronic shutter on this? Not that I know of. I don't think CCDs uh, can allow for that, that kind of shutter. Not quite the same as a DSLR. Yes. Yes, where are these parts being put together? Is the Slack? Yeah. Yes, all the almost all of the camera assembly has happened at Slack. So all these all these videos and pictures you see of this clean room, it's at Slack. It's funny, on the outside this building looks like kind of a, a scary old warehouse and then you go inside and inside of the giant warehouse is a very large, like thirty foot tall clean room. So it's kind of like nested buildings. But yeah, all of this has happened at Slack. Some of the smaller subcomponents were <coughs> built at uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York, um, and a couple of other various, like the lenses in Arizona, the filter stuff in France, but it's all coming together at Slack. Yeah. Where do the scientists sleep? Like, are there dorms? There are, yeah. There are dorms up at the top of the mountain. They're not in the same um, building that I've been showing. I don't think I have a single picture that has the dormitories, but there are. I've heard that the food up there is not very good, though, so I'll report back when I go. All right. Yes? So you're in, like, an astronomy-adjacent field. Mm -hmm. Do you ever just go out and, like, uh, with astronomer friends and look at galaxies and... Yeah, the main time that I actually do that, I'm also very involved with some volunteer work at Slack. So there's a summertime mm -hmm. camp that... It's called SAGE for, it stands for Slack Accelerating Girls in Engineering. Um, and so every year we do that, or sometimes more than once a year, and we'll go to the Stanford Stanford and Foothill Observatories and go look at stuff. But I 
unfortunately don't have any friends yet with telescopes. Now you do. But yeah, now, <laughs> now I do. So our next star party is next Saturday, and we have one the Saturday after that. So okay, I would will... love to take you up and, and bring your girls from the club, and ah, okay. we will happily have a whole star party for you. Alrighty, I'll, yeah, i got to check out more info from your guys' website. I also had uh, Romanesco broccoli last night. Oh, really? <laughs> Where do you even find it? I feel like they had to check like four grocery stores to get the one for that picture. But... Dra Draker's. Oh, Draker's. <laughs> Always Draker. <laughs> Alrighty. Shall we call it? Oh, yeah. Or, yeah what... Well, just one question on the, uh, you alluded to the, kind of some of the maintenance items, like you got to clean the mirrors every so often, uh -huh. the shutter needs replacement so often. Mm -hmm. What's sort of the scheduled known maintenance cycle? And is that a significant downtime issue? Or? Um, so the main one would be the shutter and the uh, initially like the requirement was that the sh one shutter unit had to be running full-time for two years before it w needed maintenance. Um, from all the extensive testing they did they showed that it could probably just go the whole survey <laughs> unless something went wrong. So hopefully it'll be an as-needed basis and we won't need to do nearly as much but I mean like we mentioned if something really goes wrong with the sensors that could be a pretty significant downtime, but the shutter itself is probably only like on the order of a week off sky uh, if it needs to be switched out with the spare unit. How um, many images am I? Uh, let's see, I forget the exact number we said. Because that's how many times the shutter's going to run. Exactly. It says every 40 seconds. Right. So, depends on how much dark time you have on the. Yeah, I, it depends on the time of year and well, whether or not it it's... Says 825 frame movie, but... That's in, of the entire sky. So, like, because you're taking multiple pictures, right, in order to panoramic them all together. Okay. So it's that per, okay. Yeah. So it's just for one sky frame. Exactly. So the, that's why the, that's where the, every couple of nights we'll get the full view of the sky. Weather permitting, obviously, but... Like, like I mentioned, it's, it's intentionally in this location with uh, clean, dry air. So hopefully we'll have all our ducks in a row there. Alrighty. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.